divided by. Hey, look, we're twinsies. At CVS, flu shots can be free, safe, and quick, so the whole family can get them. Now we're twinsies. Get $5 off 20 with each free flu shot at CVS. Corsair, thin skin. When I'm shaving down there, not just any razor will do. Venus for pubic hair and skin with a patented irritation defense bar. For a smooth shave with blades that barely touch skin. I'm a Venus. Yes, cheers to love. Only ET's invited to Selling Sunset Star. Happening now. The Texas voting rights bill now signed into law by the governor. When the changes could take effect at the polls and how the disabled community could be affected next. And with hospitals across the nation reaching crisis levels, a new variant of the coronavirus has now emerged. Coming up, the rising infections among children. We're settling into a sunny and dry stretch, at least for now. I'll be back to let you know when things should change and when we could have some rain chances. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at five, Texas may have a new voting law, but don't expect any major changes in the two upcoming elections. There is one later on this month in order to fill a seat that was left by Representative Pacheco and the constitutional amendments as well for the election in November. Yeah, SB1 was uh, signed into law yesterday, but it's supposed to go into effect 91 days after the last special session ended. Jesse DeGollado says among those who will be waiting and watching are the Bear County's election administrator and San Antonio's disability community. The new law won't be affecting Bear County elections anytime soon. It won't go into effect by law until December at the earliest, depending on the swirl of pending litigation trying to stop the new voting law. We are in a holding pattern, so at this point, it will have no effect on the two upcoming elections that we're doing. But when it does, says Callanan. I do believe it will have some effect. I absolutely believe it. Just as many in the disability community say they had feared and predicted. They're frightened. They don't know what to believe. A disability advocate with RevUp Texas says, for instance, the new law will make it harder for disabled voters to get the help they need. Their uh, attendant may be uh, charged with a felony if they help them fill out even their mail-in ballot. They'll also have to verify the reason why they need a personal attendant to help them vote. It would be a new form with a new requirement, but right now we don't have that. What's to come, says Kafka, will no doubt be a setback. At a time that we're building the disability vote. But in response, he says. Starting next week, September 13th to the 20th, is National Disability Voter Registration Week. We're going to do everything to try to educate our people and keep the turnout going, but it is right now sending a chilling effect. Jesse DeGollado, KSAT 12 News. A man is dead after he accidentally shot himself last night. He has been identified as 21-year-old Jacob Anthony Salazar. According to San Antonio police, it happened at a home on Carlotta Avenue over on the west side. A witness told investigators Salazar was handling the gun before it went off, hitting him in the head. He was taken to the hospital but did not survive. A man is recovering from gunshot wounds after he was hit during an argument on the northwest side this morning, very early this morning. San Antonio police say it was around 4 a.m. when the victim was found sitting in an SUV in the parking lot of the Cypress Cove Apartments on Northwest Loop 410. Police have previously released video of the shooting, which only shows two men near the car, one of them opening fire before then driving off. The family of the man who was hit thinks they there is someone out there who knows something. The family of a man gunned down outside of a far east side restaurant three years ago, asking for your help finding his killer. 44-year-old Harry and Chase was shot and killed outside Big Castle Smokehouse at I-10 and Dietrich Road back on September 8, 2018. Police have previously released video of that shooting, which shows two men near a car, one of them opening fire before driving off. Chase's family thinks someone out there knows something. Just stay together, love on each other, and just be a family, but a part of our family is missing. So we just need answers to the public, please. If you can hear us, see something, say something, please. 
Crime Stoppers is offering up to $5,000 for information that leads to an arrest of the people involved in this case. You can call them at 210-224-STOP or use the P3 Tips app. Goal number one in the state of Texas is to eliminate rape so that no woman, no person, will be a victim of rape. Governor Greg Abbott facing some criticism for these statements he made regarding Texas's new abortion law and instances of rape. The comments made yesterday during a press conference after a reporter asked the governor why force a rape victim to carry a pregnancy to term. Yeah, the governor said not only do women have until six weeks to get an abortion, but the state of Texas would work tirelessly to get rapists off the streets. Today, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki weighed in on those comments. Uh, but given there has never in history of the country in the world been any leader who's ever been able to eliminate rape, eliminate rapists from our streets, it's even more imperative. It's one of the many reasons, I should say, not the only reason why women in Texas should have access to health care. The law bans abortion after six weeks of pregnancy or once a fatal key heartbeat can be detected. Opponents of the law say that's usually before most women know they're pregnant. Tonight at 6, we will hear from one expert at the Rape Crisis Center for Comal County about how viable the governor's goal actually is. On the eve of what's expected to be a big speech from President Joe Biden over efforts to combat the growing COVID cases, some U.S. hospitals are reaching crisis levels. A new variant called Mu has emerged. All the while, Delta is still a big concern. ABC's Faith Abube has the details. Tonight, hospitals across the U.S. buckling under the weight of new COVID infections. The volume of COVID-19 cases leading to a shortage of patient beds and draining medical staff. We continue to lose people who didn't have to die. Idaho has now activated crisis care in 10 hospitals for the first time in the state's history, meaning life-saving treatments could be rationed. We hope that this day would not come. Military medics brought in to support overwhelmed hospital staff. The Pentagon also sending help to Arkansas and expanding resources in Alabama. The virus is currently raging in more than 95% of U.S. counties. The Delta variant fueling the surge. Nationwide, there are nearly four times more infections and double the number of COVID hospitalizations compared to a year ago when there was no vaccine. I have yet to admit a single person because of a vaccine related incident. 31 year old TikTok star Alexandra Blackenbiller died unvaccinated. Her last video to the site full of regret. Don't wait. Go get it because hopefully if you get it then you won't end up in the hospital like me. Across the U.S., children make up about one in four of all new COVID cases, adding to the concern as parents send their kids back to the classroom. Her lungs were going through hell. Terry Gerganius's 11-year-old ended up on a ventilator within days of the new school year. She survived, one of the lucky ones. Younger patients are dying from this, and uh, it's uh, quite disturbing. And Dr. Anthony Fauci says data from Israel shows a slight drop in the vaccine's protection against hospital stays, though still highly effective, which makes him think a third shot could become a standard part of the vaccine regimen. In Washington, Faith Abube, ABC News. It is called the anniversary effect, a feeling of sadness, grief, or anxiety. And this September 11th may be all too real for many Americans, as it is the 20th anniversary of the deadliest terror attack on U.S. soil. And as one expert explains, there are some ways, though, to cope. It's one of those defining moments in time um, that changed the way that we think about the world. 20 years ago, the day America was attacked. As we count down to September 11th, the memories may be overwhelming. It really does hit you harder, especially when they're, they're round number or big number anniversaries. It's called the anniversary effect, an increase in distress around a traumatic event. Ken Yeager, the director of the Stress, Trauma and Resilience Program at Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, says this 9-11 anniversary may be even more troubling, especially with the turmoil in Afghanistan. If you're struggling to cope, Yeager says to acknowledge your feelings and talk to someone you trust. All of these are naturally occurring emotions, and rather than trying to avoid them, it's probably more important to name them and to call them out. 
With 9-11 and in any tragic situation, Yeager says using coping skills can help. Taking a walk, giving yourself time to sit and take a few deep breaths until you work through this, or just actually doing something to commemorate the tragic losses that occurred on that day. And as a new generation is exposed to 9-11, Yeager says, remember to talk to your children. Help them work through any feelings that may come up. Yeager says it's also important to check in with your adult children as well. They may have been traumatized while watching 9-11 unfold when they were young. Meanwhile, today marks the 100th anniversary of one of the worst floods to ever hit San Antonio. We are talking about the flood of 1921, which is actually what resulted in the iconic San Antonio Riverwalk. That flood was a product of a tropical storm that first made landfall in Tampico, Mexico. The energy of that storm produced what at the time was record flooding. Over the course of seven or over the course of three days, San Antonio saw about seven inches of rain with no flood control. Then the city sustained more than three million dollars worth of property damage and dozens of people died. City leaders did learn from that storm. They developed plans to build the almost dam and what is now known as the San Antonio Riverwalk. Quite a contrast today, sunny right up near 100 degrees or 98 degrees currently, but here's the key, a dew point of 54. So a lack of humidity in the air this afternoon. And if you factor that in, the feels like temperature is 96 degrees. Usually we see it above the air temperature. That's not the case out there right now. Looking at the weather watchers well into the 90s for most of us out there in the backyards, Bulverde 95, Windcrest 96, Utopia triple digits at 100. As we go through the evening, we do have a few showers moving their way into parts of the hill country here. A little bit of upper level energy there. So some showers right now around Junction moving toward Edwards County. Otherwise, we're looking sunny and dry the rest of this evening. Low humidity, cooler mornings, changes in temperatures and promising rain chances coming up. Thanks so much, Adam. Texas leads the nation in fatalities from wrong, wrong way driving. It is an issue that uh, we have seen come across many times here in San Antonio. Our Samuel King joins us now and tells us there are some common causes for this dangerous behavior. Yeah, that's right, uh, Tim and Ursula. The AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety found that alcohol impairment, older age, and driving alone were th the three biggest causes of those incidents. Now, this person on I-35 in downtown this past holiday weekend, you see him driving the wrong way there. One of several wrong way driving incidents in San Antonio recently. The prior weekend, at least one person was killed on Loop 410. AAA Texas says these types of crashes are completely preventable. And coming up at 6, what you can do, and if you see a wrong way driver like this one, in ways that you can protect yourself. Here is a look at uh, traffic uh, this evening. Uh, this is going to be Loop 1604 at uh, Babcock. You can see some slow uh, traffic uh, there in the lanes here, the westbound lanes on 1604, right there by Six Flags in the shops at La Quintera. So here's a look at that travel time right now, 28 minutes between 281 and Bandera Road. Tim, Ursula. The summer heat is still here and it's South Texas, so it's going to stick around. Throw in some groceries in your car, though, could be a problem. The two don't mix. Up next, how to properly store your food before you put it away at home and how you might be doing it wrong next. Hot weather means a hot car, and when it comes to loading up your groceries in the car, that can be a problem because the warm temperatures on your seats can spoil your food. 12 your side's Marilyn Moritz with how to best keep your groceries and your family safe. Sonia Fujimura shops for groceries twice a week and goes prepared with an insulated bag to keep her cold stuff cold, certainly long enough to check out and drive home. Your parked car can get pretty hot, even when it's only in the 70s outside. The temperature inside the car can quickly reach 120 degrees, but it doesn't even take extreme heat to ruin your food. According to the USDA, some bacteria that can cause foodborne illness can double in 20 minutes at room temperature. So how can you keep your food fresh and safe? Plan ahead. First, try to shop in the mornings when it's cooler. Insulated bags with cold packs can help. 
Meat, poultry, and fish are at the highest risk for food poisoning, so don't let them sit in your cart while you shop for a long time. Ask for a bag of ice at the fish counter. Many people go to several grocery stores on a single trip. If you make multiple stops, make your last stop the place where you buy your meat and poultry. That way you minimize the amount of time these foods spend unrefrigerated. For the ride home, let the hot air escape out the windows for 20 seconds and crank up the AC. And of course, when you get home, put the cold sensitive foods away first. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. From the heat of summer, looking ahead to hopefully when it's a little cooler. If you love Thanksgiving, here is definitely something to look forward to. The Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade will be an in-person event this year. Last year, of course, there were no balloons or floats, just performances. Participants will need to show proof of vaccination, though. The 95th annual parade will kick off Thanksgiving morning in New York City. But then back to the heat. <laughs> it is super hot out there. Um, but uh, looking at Our Lady of the Lake, it's very pretty. There's still some green out there. This does not look like end of August, early September greenery. You know, I do foresee some changes coming our way and actually some promising rain chances coming down the line. That's the nice thing. So we're in a sunny and dry pattern here the rest of this week. Yes, and hot high temperatures right near 100. That's not going to change until the end of the weekend and into next week. It's also going to mean some cooler mornings. So these hot afternoons, ironically, also lead to the cooler mornings because of the lower humidity. So we're looking at mornings in the 60s for a few days coming ahead and then promising rain chances down the line. So let's get to it. We have a lot to talk about some changes in the air. That's for sure. Right now, well into the 90s, even 100 Stinson on the south side, triple digits century mark right now, along with Pleasanton Hondo's 99. Officially at the airport in town, 98, New Braunfels as well, Canyon Lake, 95. We're feeling the heat outside, but the thing is, we're not feeling the mugginess. You know, so often we say it's not just the heat, it's also the humidity. That's not the case right now. We don't have the mugginess out there. This is that drop in humidity we were talking about, and it's going to be even more extensive the next couple of afternoons. So dew points now in the 50s. That puts us in the pleasant category when it comes to mugginess. It's still hot outside, yes, but at least we have a little break in the humidity out there. And the lack of humidity, this break in the humidity, leads to more efficient cooling at night, better radiational cooling. In turn, we've got some 60s in the forecast. So tomorrow morning, right near 70. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I think we'll have mornings back down into the mid to upper 60s for low temperatures, and that actually takes us a little below average. But once the mugginess returns, our mornings jump back up into the 70s. But look at the impact on afternoon temperatures. As I said before, near 100 the rest of this week, then we start to see those temperatures fall off by the end of the weekend and into next week. I mean, we're talking a 10 degree chop in temperatures here, not because of any kind of front moving through, but an overall shift in our weather pattern. So let's talk about it because return of moisture means more clouds and rain chances in the days ahead. Right now we've got some energy moving toward the hill country. So Kimball County seen numerous showers and thunderstorms in a little bit uh, moving southward toward Fredericksburg as well. Uh, but for the most part, Gillespie County dry at this time. We'll see a little bit of this action continue its way through the hill country before dissipating closer to sunset. That's just a little burst of energy that's coming toward us from Dallas today. I remember Justin talking about it at nine and noon. And we had that little burst of energy uh, coming our way. That's going to move on out of here. We'll have clear skies tonight. Here's our overall pattern. Upper level high centered right over Utah. That gives us this northerly flow aloft, and it's a drier northerly flow. So our water vapor satellite imagery showing that drier air getting pushed in, and it's going to lead to some lower humidity levels the next several afternoons. But the tropical moisture that's down over the Gulf, we're talking Bay of Campeche, Yucatan Peninsula, the Caribbean, that's going to reemerge back into Texas. Just the moisture. We're not talking a big tropical system, but mugginess and really a thick humidity in our air is going to be back by Sunday and next week, and that's going to lead to better rain chances as well. So a few hill country storms this evening, otherwise not too humid, sky clearing out a calm wind by 10 o'clock, 83 midnight, right near 80. We'll start the day tomorrow at 70, but we quickly warm up by the noon hour, lower 90s, sunny, hot and dry in the afternoon, 100 degrees, the northeasterly wind at 5 to 10. So that humidity returns on Sunday with it a few isolated showers, especially closer to the Gulf Coast, but more promising rain chances overall 
combined with moisture back in our air and some energy Monday through Wednesday of next week at least. Right now we've got some scattered activity every day in the forecast and those would be the tropical downpours. Thank you, Adam. Looking forward to a little rain at this point. Yep. All right, Greg, uh, COVID forcing the Cowboys to come up with some contingency plans. Well, first is a backup to Zach Martin. Get him on the charter, which has already left and right now about landing in Tampa. Also, when we come back, what they contend they can do if for some reason he should test negative tonight, they will let us know. And a former Longhorn on renewing the rivalry with A&M coming up. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys have a contingency plan to try and get Zach Martin to the season opener in Tampa. If all the pro and Pro Bowl linemen test negative two times in a row. Martin tested positive for COVID-19 on Saturday. Now, according to league protocol, must have two consecutive negative tests after five days in order to be taken off the COVID reserve list. That has already happened today to wide receiver Noah Brown, who left with the rest of the team this afternoon. Also on board, the Cowboys charter today. Star quarterback Dak Prescott who will play his first regular season game since he was injured way back in week five of last year. Wide receiver Michael Gallup was asked how Dak looks in practice. Dak looks like he never left. Uh, he's leading the team, uh, leading the offense. Uh, I mean, he's just, you know, he's literally a coach on the field, the same as a player. Um, he does what he's supposed to do. We respect him for it. Um, you know, he's just a general. Uh, he hasn't missed a beat. Kickoff tomorrow night is at 7:20 against the defending Super Bowl champs. Houston Texans got some bad news today. Head coach David Culley says they'll be without their kicker Kai Fairbairn when they host the Jacksonville Jaguars on Sunday. Fairbairn missed the Texans' last preseason game with what the team called a minor injury. In this place will be Joey Sy, who, by the way, just signed to the practice squad on Tuesday. The Valero Alamo Bowl held their annual Rudy's Barbecue Pigskin Preview today. After having to cancel last year's due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it was great to see a packed house again in the Alamo Dome. The guest today was former Texas Longhorn and Chicago. Chicago Bear Sam Acho, who's now working for ESPN as a studio analyst. Before his appearance today, Sam was asked about his alma mater, Texas, moving to the SEC, where their rivalry against Texas A&M will resume after it ended 10 years ago when the Aggies moved to the SEC first. It's a game fans want, but what about the two schools? And it depends who you're asking, right? Because for A&M, they might not say it's important. They've been getting the top recruits. We don't need to play Texas, right? Now, Texas, Texas kind of feels the same way. We've got the most money in the state, the most money in the nation, the university. So it's like we don't need to play A&M. But I think it's really important for, like, when it comes to, like, rivalries, like people who actually, like, hate each other, just really dislike each other. Those are two schools that, for lack of better terms, can't stand each other. And I think it would be a fun game to play. I don't think a lot of people thought that game would be played ever again, at least when I was here. 10 years ago and Mac Brown was coaching me and, and no one thought the game would be played again. And, and now it looks like in the next, who knows, two years, five years, who knows how many years that game will be played again. Yeah, Sam got to play in one of the last ones, right? This year's Valero Alamo Bowl will be played on Wednesday, December the 29th at 8 p.m. That young man, by the way, very passionate. He's going to make a very great broadcaster. He really yes, is. he is. Mm -hmm. It'd be great to see that rivalry come back. Yeah, it will be. Thanks, will be. Greg. And we'll be right back. Thanks so much for watching the News at 5 with us. World News is next. We'll see you back here at 6.